I more than fasted and prayed before the God of, of heaven. So the first thing Nehemiah did was to mourn, fast, and, and pray. When he saw or heard the situation of his city, he mourned, fasted, and, and prayed. <clears throat> Meaning he was so heart sick that the city of Jerusalem was a wreck that he wouldn't just ignore the situation. He wanted something more for the capital city of his ho homeland. But he knew that without the help of God, something more wasn't going to happen. Right? Without the help of God, even if he want something more for his city, that something more is not going to happen without the help of, of God. And Nehemiah understood that. And that's why he mourned, fasted. You see that? Giving up food is not something our bodies like to do, right? How many of you love eating? <laughs> So giving up food is not something our bodies like to do, right? Yet, we need fasting and prayer because it is a tremendous, it is a tremendously practical tool when you get to a place in your life that you want something more. I think one reason of this, at least in my own life, is that I don't always eat. I don't always eat. That's why I'm skinny. <laughs> A lot of times I eat because I'm hungry for something more from God. So I need to take a break from food every once in a while to focus on what I really hungry for. Sadly, the spiritual discipline of fasting is so foreign to most Christ followers. Mm -hmm. Right? That we are like the church that has this announcement in their bulletin. The cost to attend the fasting and prayer conference in the books. <laughs> 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 Sorry. At FCF, you will hear me talk about fasting every once in a while because it is a tremendous resource mm -hmm. for experiencing something more. Mm -hmm. And it is something. You shouldn't neglect as Christians. How many years have you been a Christian? Some of you, probably five years, ten years, are you practicing this what we call prayer and fasting? Have you ever practiced prayer and fasting? If you haven't, you are missing something in your Christian life. Yes, prayer and fasting is something you shouldn't neglect. Several things we need to realize about prayer and fasting. One is we get a whole lot more than you give up than we give up when we fast and, and pray. <coughs> you like that? Mm -hmm. The price tag of giving up eating for one meal or one day or sometimes a couple of days is a small price to pay for what fasting does. And the Lord Jesus Christ put it this way. 16 to 18. When you fast, let me post in that. Did you notice that? When you fast. It is interesting to note that the Lord Jesus Christ did not say, If you fast. You see that? Jesus didn't say, If you fast. Jesus clearly expects his followers to, to fast. That's why he said, When you fast. So he is expecting you and me to do these things. Amen. Fasting and prayer. He did not say, If. Do not look as the hypocrites, do not look somewhere as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. 
I tell you the truth, they have received the reward in full. But when you fast, put oil on your head and wash your face. So that it will not be obvious to men that you are fasting, but only to your father who is unseen. And your father who says what is done, what is done in secret will reward you. Okay. Circle the word reward. Circle the word reward. In verse 16, the Greek word has to do with wages. The, the word reward. You can fast to impress others and impressing them will be your only reward. <laughs> can, I, can I repeat that? You can fast to impress others then if that is your intention, if that is your, your motive in in, in doing those, those things, prayer and fasting, then you will get your reward. And that is what? Nothing. <laughs> right. Nothing. That's your wages. Impressing them. But if you fast because you sincerely want something more, God will give you back. Will reward you. Give back is the meaning of the Greek word used for reward in verse 18. The, the word reward in verse 16, he mentioned that too, right? Verse 16 says, When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show, me, to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their, their reward. But it also mentioned in, in verse 18, right? So that's the reward. In verse 18, that's the reward that the Lord will, will give us. So give back is the meaning of the Greek word used for reward in verse 18. Being rewarded by God is better than enjoying eating food. It's better than what man can cook up for you. There's a reward from God for fasting. You get a lot more than you give up when you fast and, and pray. Second, fasting doesn't change God. Amen? Amen? Remember that when you fast and pray, it's not going to change God. Right? Maybe that's, your, that's, your, that's what you're thinking. Maybe I can, I, can, I can change God. No, you cannot change God. You cannot manipulate God. We can never change God. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. Open your Bible. Malachi chapter 3 verse 6. What does it say? Your, your iPod, your iPad. What does it say? I, the Lord, your God. What does it say? Do not change, right? I, the Lord, your God, do not change. So when we pray and fast, we cannot change God. God is unchangeable. And we cannot manipulate Him. He is unchanging. <coughs> You see that? Malachi 3 verse 6. I, the Lord your God, do not change. God has already plans for us. And that plan for you and me has not going to change. It's not going to change. What does it say in Jeremiah 29 verse 11? For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans to prosper you and not to harm you. That's the plan of God in our lives. And it's not going to change that. It's not going to harm us. So when we pray and fast, it doesn't change God. It changes us. God already wants to answer our prayers. Fasting changes us. So the physical hunger we feel when we go without food for a meal or two or a day or two is, rep is a representative of a much greater hunger. A hunger for God and what He has for us. You know what? A, a hungry stomach repre represents a hungry spirit. And it takes a hungry spirit for God to affect the kind of change in our lives that makes us ready for something more. In 
Verses, verses 6 and following, we read this in Isaiah 58, 6 to 12. It is not this, it is not this, the kind of fasting I have chosen to lose the chains of injustice and untie the cords of the yoke to set the oppressed free and break every yoke. Is it not? To share your food with with the hungry and to provide the poor wanderer with shelter. When you see the naked, to clothe him and not to turn away from, from, from your own flesh and blood. Then your light will break forth like the dawn and your healing will quickly appear. Then your righteousness will go before you and the glory of the Lord will be your rear guard. 9 to 12. Then you will call and the Lord will answer. You will cry for help. And he will say, here I am. Here am I if you do away with the yoke of oppression, with the pointing finger and malicious talk. And if you spend yourselves in behalf of the hungry and satisfy the needs of the oppressed, then your light will rise in the darkness and your night will come like the noonday. The Lord will guide you always. He will satisfy your needs in sun, scorched land and will strengthen your frame. You will be like a well-watered garden, like a spring whose waters never fail. Your people will rebuild the ancient ruins and will raise up the eight, the eight old foundations. You will be called repairer of broken walls, restore of streets with, with dwellings. So that's the, the passage that I used use some days ago, right? So fasting doesn't change, change God. And the Lord Jesus Christ and the Lord... God himself set the tone. This is how we have to, we need to, this is what I want you to, to fast. And third, <clears throat> fasting is simple and doable. Right? You believe that? Fasting is simple and doable. One way the people of Bible times would fast is really very simple. They would fast until evening, as we see in 1 Samuel, verse uh, chapter 7, verse 6, and 2 Samuel chapter 1, verse 12. For the Jews from sundown to sundown was one was one day, not from midnight to midnight, like we observe. So they would fast from sundown to sundown, which is pretty simple. And when you fast, don't try to cheat me. I want I want to fast. I, I want to fast from evening to the morning while you're sleeping. <laughs> so at the close of this this message I'm going to ask or distribute a a commitment card. If you wanna if you wanna try this later on I will distribute this. And if the, the Lord, the Holy Spirit is leading you to do this, feel free. And you are making a commitment before God. And try to, to post this in your refrigerator to remind you of your commitment. You can choose one meal each week to miss one meal each week. Or if you want to do it one day each week, it's up to you. It's your choice. And you have many options. Okay? And I challenge you that when you do that, when you sign up this one, this commitment card, spend time, really spend time praying Amen. and reading the word. And don't go somewhere else. <laughs> spend time reading the word and praying. And listen to God, what the Lord is telling you. Maybe God is telling you something. <clears throat> and sometimes we cannot hear it because of so many distractions. So we have commitment card here and you can start distributing it while I'm still sharing. So again, 
Remember that fasting has a, a partner, and it is called prayer. We may not have enough, enough. So how do you pray when you need something more from God? <clears throat> how do you pray when you want something more from God? First thing is put food on the back burner. And second, putting prayer on the front burner. Some of us don't think praying is, praying is the thing to do when we want something more. And we think about soliciting the help of our friends when we want something, right? When we want to do something, the tendency is to approach our friends, right? Solicit their, their insights rather than going to God in prayer and fasting. Especially when it comes to making a major decision in your life. Who do we approach? Sometimes we tend to approach our friends, right? First. And then, at the end, we come to God. That shouldn't be. First thing that we should do as Christians is to come to God in prayer. Asking for his guidance. And second, we can approach our friends, our spiritual leaders. First thing that we should do is to approach God, not to approach our friends. And we may even think about giving up. The challenge before us may be too daunting. Sometimes you are like that with God. I say, God, I'm busy. I don't have time to talk to you right now. But the thing is, you have time to talk to, to your friends. To approach them. <laughs> and so we lose a lot of valuable spiritual oil. We keep spinning our wheels when God wants us to talk to Him. Everything. The Bible says, come to me. You who are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. And Jeremiah said, Call unto me, and I will answer thee and show you mighty things that you have not known. <laughs> Brethren, nothing wrong with getting our friends to help us out in, in a tight spot, but don't forget what the scripture gives us. James chapter 5, verse. 16 says, the earnest prayer of a righteous person has great power and produces wonderful results. That's why Nehemiah prayed. Look, at, look once again at his prayer in verse 5. Nehemiah chapter 1. Then I said, O Lord, God of heaven, the great and awesome God, who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his commands. You see that? That's how we need, we need to begin our praying when we want something from God. We need to praise Him first. Praise Him for who He is. For what He has done. Not asking immediately. Lord, I praise You for what You have done. And for what You are doing in my life. Let us not have this attitude that when we approach Him, Lord, I want this, I want that, I want to go there, I want my, my spouse to be changed. Everything. It's all a request. Let's start praising God when we come before Him. And you know what? That's one of the characteristics of the Koreans. When they when they pray, they they spend hours praying. You know their secret? Their secret is they focus on the blessings. 
thanking God for all the things that they have received, and in, including the problems. They focus on much more on the blessing, not on what they want. That's no wonder they spent so many hours praying to God. Can you imagine this? Yeah. When you wait, try to try to, to to come to God, ask just focus your your mind asking. In just a few minutes, you're done. Right. Mm -hmm. But if you focus on the blessings, you will be surprised. You have already spent hours, and yet you're not done. You're not done yet with with praising God, in praising God. So let us focus on the blessings, not on asking from God. Because I focus on the praises, not on what we want. That's how we need to begin our praying when we want something more, like Nehemiah. Oh Lord God of heaven, the great and awesome God who keeps his covenant of love with those who love him and obey his, his commands. So that's how we begin our prayer, our prayer. Telling God that we appreciate him, his wonderful attributes. We too are emboldened when we begin our prayers thinking about God and His greatness rather than dwelling on our need first. And we remember how able God is to supply our needs. Verses 6 to 7. We read this. Let your ear be attentive and your eyes open to hear the prayer of your servant is praying before you day and night for your servants, the people of Israel. I confess the sins we Israelites, including myself and my father's house, have committed against you. We have acted very wickedly toward you. We have not obeyed the commands because commands decrease and laws you gave your servant Moses. So why should we pray like this? Why should we pray like this? Because 2 Chronicles chapter 7 says, If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray, and turn from their wicked ways, then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and heal their land. You see? The Lord God laid down the prayer we said that before He answered us, He hear our prayers, we need to do these things. What's the prayer we said? Do you remember when you when you were still in college? You cannot just take a subject when, when you are taking a five-year a five degree course. You cannot simply take the, the subjects on when you, you're already uh, taking your, your, your major, right? If you are taking an algebra, if you're in the first year, let's say you are taking an engineering, you first, before you, you take the higher mathematics, you need to, to take algebra first. You cannot simply take calculus, right? You need to go through the lower math. And they will not allow you to take the higher, the higher subjects without passing those, the subject in, in, in the lower level. So that's the prerequisite. If my people who are called by my name, what's the prerequisite? Humble. Shall humble themselves. Pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. And if we do that, what did he say? Then I will hear from heaven. I will forgive their sins and heal their, their land. That's the prerequisite. If you want God to answer our prayers, if you want God to answer our prayers, then we need to humble ourselves before him. Seek his face and turn from our wicked ways. Maybe we should, we should take our attitude. Why is it that my prayer is not being answered? Am I doing the prerequisite? That is laid down in, in, in 2 Chronicles chapter 7, verse 14. Ask ourselves, ask yourself. 
If my people were called by my name, who is who are his people? That's us. You and I are his people. Those who are called on his name, by his name. If my people who are called by my name shall humble themselves, pray and seek my face, then I will hear from heaven, I will forgive their sins and heal their, their land. Brethren, that's the prayer we say. God says, my people, the ones called by my name are the ones who need to humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Then God promises to hear from heaven and forgive our sins and heal our, our land. If the church accepts its assignment as salt and light, our culture can be, can be healed. We have an assignment as a church. Next, verses 8 to 9. Remember the, the instruction you, you gave your servant Moses saying if you are unfaithful. See that? If you are unfaithful, I will scatter you among the nations. But if you return to me and obey my commands, then even if you, if your exiled people, if, even if your exiled people are at the farthest horizon, I will gather them from there and bring them to the place I have chosen as a dwelling for my name. See that? We often fail to consider that many of the unchurched people around us are actually Christ followers who have become unfaithful, who have become negligent of worship, or they become discouraged, or like this scripture calls them unfaithful, unfaithful. Have you seen yourself in this situation? In your Christian life? Once you were unfaithful. But then, God brought you back. What's the promise? Remember in the Old Testament, God saw his people straying from worshiping him as a spiritual adultery, a spiritual unfaithfulness. In the New Testament, Jesus calls the church his bride. So the analogy is still the same. It's still in effect. So when you and I, who know Christ, begin to neglect our worship and become unfaithful to God, there are terrible consequences. But God says, if you return to me and obey my commands, I will bring you back. Once you were unfaithful, right? But he promised that if you return to me and obey my commands, then I will bring you, I will bring you back. Right? That's the promise. If you have wandered and desire to come back, God promised that he will accept us. Just like the story of the prodigal son, right? He wandered. But then there was a time he came to his senses, senses and returned to his, to his father. And God accepted him. And the same thing with God. If you return to me and obey my commands, I will bring you back. It's a promise. But if you remain unfaithful to him, choose to disobey him, he said, you will suffer the consequences of your unfaithfulness, of your disobedience. So let us pray for God to help those who have drifted from God to return to Him and obey His commands. How many of your friends whom you know, they are Christians and yet they are out there instead of here with you, worshiping God, listening to His word? How many of them? Spend time praying for them. Maybe you can include them in what, when, when, you are, when you are doing the prayer and fasting. And watch God, how he, he, he moved in the lives of these people. Include them. When you, when you, when you do that, when, when we do that, those pr th that prayer and fasting, let us not be selfish, okay? Don't just focus on your needs. Look around and see the needs. 
around you. Look at your seatmate. The person sitting next to you. Is there a need? You can see? There's nobody who can pray for that. <laughs> Spend time with that person. And you will realize that that person sitting next to you, whether your spouse or not, he's, that person is going through a tough times. Unless you find out, then you don't know what to pray for that per what to pray for for that person. Don't just focus on your needs. What's the need of these kids of this fellowship? Focus on that. And put on the bottom, bottom of your list, your need. Prioritize the need of other people. Then God is telling you, hey, my child, you're not the only one who has a need. <laughs> Get out of yourself. The problem with you, my child, is that you only see your need. Open your eyes and see the need around you. Maybe God, maybe that, that is what God is telling you right now. Sometimes we are so selfish that we only see our needs, not the needs of other people. Ten to eleven. They are your servants, and your people whom you have redeemed by your great strength and your mighty hand. O oh Lord, let your ear be attentive to the prayer of this your servant and to the prayer of your servants who delight in revering your name. Give your servant success today by granting him favor in the presence of this man. I was cupbearer to the king. The man Nehemiah wanted favor from the king of Persia. And Nehemiah had the trusted position of tasting the king's food and drink, right? And kings were often the targets of assassination. Assassination plots and poisoning the king's food was a common ploy. So ancient kings employed cupbearers to risk their lives to see if the food and drink was safe for the king's consumption. It's a tough job, right? Much like the president's secret service today, right? Nehemiah literally laid his life on the line for his, for his boss. So you can see what a position of trust and responsibility this was. Nehemiah was a person of integrity. You don't start fasting and praying until you have a certain amount of integrity of trustworthiness. When principles and morals matters to you, when you care about being and doing right, prayer and fasting become a great resource for you. Pray that God would give give us give you success and favor with others around around you. That you would live with integrity, especially those of you who are in the military. I open here the place. It's hard to live as Christians. Is it really hard? I don't think so. When this cupbearer heard how the city of Jerusalem, the capital city of his mother country, was still in ruins with no one to protect it, he knew that he was going to have to do something about the broken down state of affairs in, in, in Jerusalem. Even though he was positioned in the citadel of Susa, the capital of Persia, Nehemiah could have said, it is not my problem. He could have said that. He saw that Jerusalem is in ruins, and he could have said, it's not, my, it's not my problem. I don't care if Jerusalem is in ruins. I have a good life here, and doing the life here in Persia. He did not say that. Nehemiah wanted something more for his people, his country, and for the work of God. Nehemiah was concerned about others. How about us? 
are we concerned about others as well? Just like Nehemiah. Lord, I want something more for this for this fellowship. Lord, I want something more for this for this man. Lord, I want to see this man return to you. Is that how is that our attitude? Or is our attitude when we see a brother or a sister wandering? I don't care. Is that our attitude? Brethren, that shouldn't be. When we when a, when a brother or a sister is wandering, we should grieve and pray for that person. Ask God to convict those people. Just like Nehemiah, he was not satisfied. Lord, I want something more for this city. And I cannot do it without you, without your help. Nehemiah wanted something more for his people his country. And he, Nehemiah was concerned about others. Some of these people only get the something more that comes from conniving and striving on their own. And some of these people get something more from God. When you read the book of Nehemiah, you see that Nehemiah did receive something more from God, but this is where it begins. So the commitment card that commit commitment card that was passed prayerfully consider that. You are not committing to me, but you are committing to me. It can be when you pray it can be something personal, but try and make it something that if it is personal, it at least affects more people than just you. And I want you to take that communication card and put it somewhere you will see it every day to remind you of your commitment. And as I have said a few weeks ago, if lunch is really hard for you to give up, then give that up to God. Don't give up mail that is easy for you to give up. Give up something. Give up the meal that is really hard for you to give up and spend time praying to God, listening to Him. And watch God, how He moves and how He changes you. And again, as I've said, prayer and fasting is not going to change God. It changes us. Our God is an unchanging God. As Malachi 3 says, I, the Lord your God, do not change. I, the Lord your God, do not change. So when we pray and fast, expect that God will change you. Not him. Amen? Amen. Shall we pray? Father, once again, we want to thank you for your word that we have just heard. We thank you, Lord, for reminding us what prayer and fasting can do in our Christian life. And we thank you, Lord, for teaching us that Prayer and fasting is not going to change you, but it changes us. And we thank you, Lord, for your word. As you said, Lord, in Malachi, in, in Malachi chapter 3, verse 6, I, the Lord your God, do not change. And we thank you, Lord, even for 
the plans that you have for us. As you mentioned, O Lord, in Jeremiah chapter 29, verse 11, I, the Lord, for I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you hope and a future. Father, help us as your people to discover what your plan is in our lives. Your will in our lives, Lord. And through prayer and fasting, Lord, we know that we will discover more of your will, more of your plans in our lives. Father, help us as, as, as your people that as we go through this process of prayer and fasting, help us, Lord, to be willing to change and accept your will, O Lord, in our lives. Father, as you reveal yourself, as you reveal your, your plans in our lives, help us not to resist it, but be willing, O Lord, to obey you. faithful, Lord, in obeying your commands. Father, you know us. You know where we are. You know every heart, Lord, that is in this place. You know, Lord, where they are in the relationship with you. Father, may you continue to speak to every heart that is in this place. And open, O Lord, our spiritual eyes. And see, O Lord, where we are. something more. We are not satisfied, O Lord, to where we are in our relationship with you. Lord, we want to grow more. We want to know you more. And we want to know more of your will, of your plans. And we can only, O Lord, discover those plans and your will when we spend time with you through prayer and fasting, reading your word. Thank you, Father. God, may you continue to be glorified even in our actions, in our thought life, even, Lord, as we do this prayer and fasting. And as a church, Lord, we are committing ourselves to skip a meal, Lord. excited, the Lord, to what you are about to reveal in our lives as we spend time with you. Thank you, 
Father, once again. And we are excited, the Lord, to see what you will do in our midst, in our congregation as we gather together in worship. When we do this, prayer and fasting as a church, corporately as a church. Shall we all rise for our closing song?